Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the Australian Banking Association's uh, National Economic Series panel this morning. Uh, today, we'll be looking at Banking 2021 and what's ahead. Uh, but first of all, uh, let me introduce to you our panel. I'm Anna Bly, the CEO of the Australian Banking Association, and I'm joined today uh, by three uh, panellists who each bring a very different and interesting perspective uh, to the challenges that we're all looking at, challenges and opportunities. First of all, can I introduce Nikesh uh, Lachandani. Nikesh has worn many hats in the finance and innovation space. He is the author of Payments and Banking in Australia, From Coins to Cryptocurrency. He has an extensive and varied background from startup founder to professional services consultant and emerging technology, innovation and payments lead for some of Australia's largest banks. Nikesh has been in the middle of many innovations of our time, from mainstream payments to blockchain and artificial intelligence. He's held a number of board positions with startups, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from him today. Uh, next, we have joining us uh, Bessa Data. Bessa has a long and distinguished career in financial services. She is currently the chief economist of the St George Banking Group, which includes St George, Bank of Melbourne, Bank SA and Rams. As the bank's economic spokesperson, Bessa is responsible for research on the economy and financial markets. She formulates views and forecasts on the outlook for the economy, interest rates and currencies, and that must have been a challenge in 2021 at times. Sorry, Rosanna. <laughs> along with managing a team of, ec of economists. And finally, I'm very pleased that we're joined today by Colin Heath. Colin is PwC's Australian banking leader. He plays several roles, independent expert for regulators and boards. He advises on risk, finance and regulatory matters and assists PwC clients uh, with responses to the Royal Commission into Banking and Finance. Colin is a regular in the media and has co-authored PwC publications on the future of banking, bank operating models, open banking, negative rates and trust in financial services, among many other things. Uh, Colin, um, as I said, is PwC's uh, banking lead. Uh, PwC is an associate member of the ABA uh, and has been a very valued partner, particularly in 2020, on some of the unprecedented challenges that the industry was facing. So, banking 2021, what does it look like? I think we would all acknowledge that uh, whatever happens next year, we will still be dealing with much of what has happened this year. So I'm going to start with, um, I'm going to start with a very wide net and ask each of our panellists uh, something as broad as your thoughts on 2020. Nikesh. Yeah, so th thanks, Senator. I think, I think it's just been, I, look, at the beginning of COVID, around March or April, everyone used one word. They said, this is unprecedented. And I think we've given up on that word, but absolutely, we never expected um, what we ended up getting. And I think, I think particularly from a banking point of view, uh, the changes that we've seen have kind of accelerated what was already happening, but it's been a, f uh, you know, a, a bizarre year, to say the least. So one of, what, I think one of the big things that, that I've noticed is the move away from cash. So this has been a gradual move, right? So it's, for us in Australia, it's been a 200 year journey from hard currency to um, uh, fiat currency. Uh, we had the Bretton Woods um, system and now we're moving into electronic money. So really money's moved from something that was very tangible and physical. And now if you, if you hand over a note or a coin, um, you know, people, people take it quite offensively in some cases. But um, where, where we're moving to is, is quite interesting. I, I think a lot of people are getting used to the idea that money is just a few pixels on a screen. And I think, I think that's a really big uh, mind shift. And we're going to see more of that um, in the future. Um, thanks, Nikesh. Bessa, thoughts on 2020? Well, I agree that um, unprecedented is a very key word for 2020. But if I had to pick another word, it would be uncertainty. So as we've moved through 2020, it's just been a rolling series of uncertainty. We had the bushfires, uh, we've had COVID-19, which we're still in the grips of. Uh, we've had deteriorating trade tensions and we've also had the US election. And you throw that all together and it's a heightened degree of uncertainty that businesses and consumers yeah. have had to work through. What I would also say is in the first half of this year, I think we thought uh, policymakers, economists, bankers, we all thought it would be a lot worse 
than what it actually is. And I think the second half of this year, we actually have seen economic indicators suggest that this year isn't going to be as big a downturn as what we feared at the height of the pandemic. So I think back in May, the RBA was predicting, you know, um, GDP would be down 6% this year, but they now think it will be 4% and we think it will be down 3%. Now, it still uh, has ended the enviable run uh, that Australia had, which was nearly 29 years without a recession. Uh, but I guess um, we're possibly finishing 2020 on a bit of a stronger note than, say, where we were at in April or May. Um, yes, and I think we're all glad about that. But as you say, not quite certain where that might be in the next quarter and the one after that and the one after that. There's still a lot of um, ifs that we might face um, globally. Uh, Colin, you've got uh, a bird's eye view on the industry. Your thoughts on um, 2020? Yeah, well, I think I'd echo a bit of that. Um, I, I think it's remarkable that where, where we're at. Back in April, I think I wouldn't have dared to hope we'd be in as good a position as we are as a country and as an industry um, in December as, as has emerged. So there, there's a lot to thank, um, many factors for that, I think, what, what government's done and, and the way um, the health crisis has been managed. And I think banks have played a phenomenal role in that. They, they played a role as shock absorber when um, the initial uncertainty hit and uh, that gave Australia the time and customers the time to work out how to respond, what innovation was required to, to what we just referenced in terms of cash and many, many other innovations that have taken place in a very rapid um, changing environment. But the position we're in now is really that the industry is in a position to help the recovery, to help springboard Australia um, into its next iteration, which I, which I think is going to be not just about next year, but the next several decades. And there's a phenomenal opportunity we have in front of us now, which um, we'll obviously talk about today. But, but there's some very important decisions and actions over the next 12 months to, to take us there. One reflection, perhaps for me, at an overall level would be that that shock absorber role was really catalyzed by a statesman-like position that the industry took. Uh, in response to the crisis. I, I think it's easy to forget that it would have been quite easy for another scenario to play out in, with the degree of uncertainty that, that we had back in April and people working through game theory of how to respond and survive and protect themselves. But what we saw was the industry coming together with government in, in a way that sort of cut through all of that to focus on the good of the country and we're in such a better place for it. And, and just to add to that, Colin, I think, I think the interesting thing is the role of technology, and I, I don't know what you think, but if you, if you compare this, and a lot of us, us were comparing this at the outset to the Great Depression, because it could have potentially been that sort of scenario. Um, the big advantage I think we had was technology. So if you look at things like JobKeeper, I don't think you would have been able to do that logistically back in the Depression. And the role of um, you know, the, the, the tax office, and as you said, the banks using technology to, to quickly try and get the money where it needed to be very quickly um, was, was phenomenal. And I think, I think uh, you know, we, we often overlook it, but you know, the fact that we're um, a much more digital and a much more uh, you know, technologically advanced um, society has, has contributed to the recovery. And I think that's what's helped businesses pivot yeah. their operations as well, like either going online, sp online spending has really increased into the double digit um, growth, uh, growth rates, uh, but also um, it's really helped businesses instead of closing down, they've been able to move uh, their business online where possible. And going back to your original point, Nagesh, uh, it is a lot easier to move virtual money to where it's needed mm -hmm. and to do that quickly and in a very targeted way than uh, when you had to carry it around in you know, secure boxes um, right. as gold bars or you know, cash in the back of a security truck. So uh, it is certainly a, a good reflection about what might have been possible for governments and other parts of the economy if this had happened mm -hmm. even 20 years ago. Yeah. Not, we don't even sure. need to go back to the depression, I think, to yeah. reflect on that. Um, next year, I, I think you know, everybody has acknowledged um, the move, the very fast pivot from banks and their willingness against all of their competitive instincts to, um, to act collectively in the public interest. 
Um, and we are now seeing um, a much higher percentage of customers who deferred their loan repayments uh, moving back into full payments than we had anticipated would be the case you know, in October and November uh, of, of the year. But nevertheless, next year, 2021, I think banks expect to face a much bigger challenge with more customers uh, facing hardship, whether they are um, mortgage customers or business customers or even small amounts of unsecured credit can put people into serious hardship. Um, so as government support ends um, over the first quarter, uh, there is going to be some tough decisions for banks and their customers. Um, and I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. And I might start with you on that, Colin, because I know um, you and your team have put, some lot, put a lot of thinking and are working with banks on this. Yeah, next year's a, going to be a fascinating year. The way we've framed that up is around uh, reckoning range and variation. Um, by reckoning, we're going to move into a, a real economy versus a, what's effectively been a false economy this year with the stimulus that's flowed through and the way that forbearance in all sorts of forms have supported the economy. And um, as a result of that reckoning, there is going to be uh, a, a wide number of issues for, for for a number of customers of banks in Australia and a whole number of institutions are, are going to face difficulty, some of which are pandemic driven. And we'll see um, what may be temporary, but still quite over quite a reasonable period of time struggles for certain businesses and certain sectors. Um, and we'll also see struggles for customers that were perhaps coming anyway, but the um, pandemic has accelerated them. So there's definitely going to be a wrestling. There's going to be challenge for many customers. What, one of the difficulties when we look to next year is is the range of scenarios that might play out. So, you know, we are in a position today, I think, where we can be. Um, optimistic in an alert way about the, the economic outlook. outlook. We can, there's certainly a base case that's far better than we could have hoped for earlier this year. Um, and when we work through that, um, uh, that base case and then the permutations and the, the variations that might emerge around it, um, what we're going to see is a need to be very, very alert and sensitive to what we see that's happening because we've still got so many uncertainties locally and globally to play out. And the final piece of that then comes into variation where the, the nature of the pandemic, the economic crisis and the stimulus and how it's all going to flow through is going to be very uneven. And so we're going to have, we would think, some sectors under great challenge, but also some sectors with unprecedented um, growth prospects and uh, an opportunity in a new and reformed economy. And we're talking about that um, as a almost like a recessionary boom. So it's quite feasibly ne the case next year that we will have GDP at near record growth levels at the same time as we have bankruptcy, insolvency at near record levels. And, and those two things happening in concert is not something we, we've seen before. I don't think it's happened in any circumstance that we can envisage. And that means that there's going to be a need to have two focuses at the same time. How do we help those that are struggling at the same time as how do we support the growth that's emerging and needed and play our role in catalyzing okay. that? So it's going to be a fascinating year. Colin, I'm sorry, but um, apparently we're having a little trouble with your audio. Um, but thank you for the, um, I think that, that that's a good framework to think about customers in hardship um, f for all of us into 2021. Um, I just wonder, you know, Bessa, do you see, uh, you know, the issue of all banks dealing with more customers in hardship than they would normally, even if it's not as many as they had feared this year? No doubt there will be more than is normally the case and how you're seeing the impact of that across you know, the broader economy, some communities, sectors, geographies, 
and your thinking yeah, on Yeah, I guess to pick up some of the earlier th threads, um, I think 2020 has been a year of collaboration. And I think we've certainly seen that in the banking industry where they've worked very closely with government and other policy makers to try and help businesses as much as possible. I know within our group, we've actually got a um, dedicated area that is trying to help those customers that are really struggling through the pandemic as much as possible. So I would expect that will actually continue through um, 2021. I agree that when some of the stimulus measures from the federal government expire, that might cause some disruption for some businesses that are still finding it very challenging. There's still a high number of businesses, I guess, or a high share of businesses that are, I guess, um, uh, still hanging on to cash flow and trying to build cash flow buffers. So that's suggesting um, that they're relying on cash on hand to fund their operations and may struggle if those stimulus measures um, end. I also think there's quite a good possibility that the federal government might actually extend some of the key measures like JobKeeper um, wind it back or just target it to particular industries. Um, but I still think the economy is probably not strong enough to actually just cut it off at the end of March. There's also some key measures that start to kick in from the federal budget, um, particularly the um, uh, the, carry, the loss carry back measure and, and also the immediate expensing, they, they, the, the impact of those temporary measures will be felt more deeply in the second half of next year. Uh, and so I think that will help, um, hopefully, um, business investment. Um, but um, coming back to what we're seeing, I guess it is still, whilst businesses are releasing some of their caution, it's actually not flowing through to, uh, you know, an increase significantly in bond borrowing or business investment. Um, mm. And so that will hold back activity and also jobs growth. Mm. Um, yes, that, that issue of, um, well, we talked a little bit already about changed customer behavior around cash and currency and um, you know, moving, accelerating their move to digital banking. Yeah. Um, but we've also seen a real retreat to very conservative customer behavior, um, very high rates of um, household savings, uh, you know, lots of high rates, unprecedented rates of pay down of debt. So customers with a very solid buffer, which is a good thing for them, uh, maybe not so good uh, in terms of what the, you know, the governor of the Reserve Bank would like to see happening to consumption. But if you take into account, so it's, you know, it's not just banks that are dealing, that we're looking at in terms of, I think it's fair to say 2020 and on many fronts has changed everything. Um, so you've got you know, very significant changes in customer behaviour, but it's also about um, you know, low to no um, net new migration, immigration. We'll be in a post-Trump world. Uh, we've got escalating trade issues with China. Uh, we've got continued pressure to get consensus on um, Australia's energy policy and climate change policy. You know, in that context, and I might start with you, Nikesh, um, it seems to me there's lots of challenges there, but like every challenge or every crisis, there's also opportunities there for innovation. Um, and I just wonder how you see, you know, 2021 could easily be a very tough year, but as Colin said, for some uh, sectors and some um, individuals and some businesses, uh, it could actually be a year of kind of takeoff, couldn't it? That's right, that's right. So I think, I think we, you know, we, so 2020, uh, as we all said, came as a big shock. It came as a big shock to, to a lot of people. Um, I think one of the challenges that we're going to have uh, in in the coming year is okay. Now, what what do we what lessons have we learned? You know, how do we now um, realign ourselves to hopefully make use of the challenges that we've got? So, so Anna, you're absolutely right. I think I, I'm I'm personally really worried about what's happening in China. I think. Thankfully, um, you know, due to the uh, um, uh, you know nuclear nuclear um, uh, deterrent, we're not going to see a war. We are going to possibly see uh, a prolonged uh, trade dispute or a trade um, uh, argument with, with with China. And and one of the challenges look is that if if tomorrow we lost all of our exports to China, that would be devastating to the economy. So how do we realign ourselves? I think the other thing that we learned was. Um, the need to kind of be self-reliant, because in the early days of, of COVID, I think uh, a lot of us noticed that there were, there were not a lot of um, uh, manufactured goods in Australia. O over the years, um, this has been happen happening gradually. There's more and more automation. Um, there's less certainty about jobs. 
during COVID, there were a lot of, a lot of people that were um, initially laid off. A lot of those jobs did come back. But, but I, think, I think the stigma associated with losing your job and the permanency of full-time employment is slowly um, uh, being reduced. And what we're going to find, I think, is that um, we're going to have to realign, I think, to, if you like, more um, high, higher skilled occupations. Um, because the interesting thing with uh, with um, Australia and the low-skilled work is that the medium-skilled jobs just, are just not going to be there. We're going to have to lift our game. And I think one of the areas, I think, one of the big um, areas that uh, I think people could be looking at is uh, in, in smart manufacturing. Um, we, we turned our backs to manufacturing as a country largely because it was cheaper, labor was cheaper in other countries. But if you look at smart manufacturing, that's a very different story. That's about using automation to produce goods and uh, goods and manufactured um, uh, uh, objects. So I think I think that's going to potentially be be a really um, a, a really big opportunity for a lot of organisations. Um, uh, skilling in smart industries as well, more education is is, is another thing I think the government's looking at. Um, the the other one, the other opportunity I think in the banking sector is the kind of two. Um, economic speeds almost uh, in terms of wealth. So, so the ability to get credit for um, a home loan, the ability to get credit for the stock market is is stronger than it ever was. I mean, I think it's amazing. I don't know what you think that the the, the share market um, did so well. Um, I don't think anyone predicted that, and that the property market hasn't uh, hasn't um, uh, you know retreated as much as we thought it would, which is quite quite interesting. But I think I think the big challenge that we've got now, particularly in the banking and finance sector, is availability for consumer credit. And I'd be inter interested to hear from the others, you know, um, what they think. But I think that's a really big opportunity. We're seeing a little bit, a hint of it with buy now, pay later. It's almost like the Wild West, though, the credit card days of the 1970s where, I don't know if anyone would remember, but um, you know, people would get 16 uh, bank cards and you know, the banks have cleaned that up and we're, we're very diligent now. But now we've got the Wild West now with buy, buy now, pay later. Where's that gonna go? Um, and, and what's the opportunity in consumer financing, consumer lending at that end of the spectrum? I think that's gonna be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess 2020 has really been a year in which also innovation has just grown exponentially and yeah. it's changed the way we work, we live and learn. And I think, you know, part of that story is also the way consumers access credit um, and, and also the way, I guess, um, businesses have changed their operations. Um, and I was talking about that high household savings ratio. It came down very slightly in the September quarter, but remains very, very elevated. So one way we could look at that very high household household savings ratio is that um, households through much of this year have repaired their balance sheets and that's actually pent up demand that might get unleashed mm. into consumer spending if consumers feel more confident about the outlook and really I think that's the key next year mm. if somehow uncertainty um, can moderate and, and people and businesses can feel more confident about the outlook then spending is likely to pick up and we will have a better um, growth year but I think um, it's still likely to be quite a bumpy one uh, and, and a lumpy recovery because of the different impact that COVID's had on industries and therefore industries are recovering at a very different mm. level. Um, you mentioned housing. Um, you're right, um, the downturn hasn't been as severe as what many people thought. We actually didn't think it'd be that severe because when we went back through past recessions, what it really revealed is that in um, economic downturns, there's not that much uh, available stock of housing to buy. People actually take their house off the market yes. um, for sale unless they're forced to sell that home. But the banking industry has provided mortgage moratoriums through this very difficult mm -hmm. period. And so what we have seen is there's not that much available stock. So that's helped prices through a very difficult period. And actually in more recent months, we've actually seen, I think, the green shoots of a recovery coming through. Mm -hmm. We've got very low rates of interest. So even when the stimulus measures from the federal government um, are wound back. Um, the, the RBA governor has said that for at least three years you can expect the cash rate not to be raised. So we've got very low rates of interest and I think that will help housing. But the headwinds are, of course, the very low rates of population growth and um, the low numbers of immigration um, that are likely that's within that mix. Yes, so I'm pleased you mentioned that one because I think 
of all the sort of issues on that list domestically, um, along with the um, trade issues with China, that uh, we will, I think, we're now set over the next two to three years to have the lowest rate of net immigration um, since, you know, in a hundred years, more than a hundred years, years yeah. since before the Second World War. So uh, that is, I think, so that's a bit of an unknown for us. And if you combine that with, um, you know, the significant reduction of overseas students who are not migrating here, but they might be living here for three to five years, so they're part of, you know, population and, and consumer behaviour. Um, Colin, I'm hoping we've got your audio um, uh, read, remedied, and I just wondered if you had any additional thoughts on that broad issue about, you know, all of those factors, not just in banking, but the broader economy and how that's likely to impact and potentially provide opportunities for innovation in 2021. Yeah, I do. Um, I think if, if we come to that question of innovation, what are we going to see, and combine it with um, how it is we've navigated through this and why it is that stock markets and um, housing markets and other asset markets haven't um, declined. I think we, we've got actually quite an important obligation here because we've effectively borrowed a trillion dollars from future generations. And if we don't think big about how we spend that, there is a risk that what, what we do with it is inflate asset prices in certain markets and widen the wealth gap. And the better answer, and clearly the important answer for future generations, is going to be to invest in the long-term infrastructure, infrastructure in the broadest sense, not just roads and bridges and things, but obviously those are important too, to set us up for the future. And I think there's, there's, a, there's a really important kind of um, coming together of industry, the banking sector, government, uh, to try and drive the right decisions to be made to, to set us up for that. And the, and the role for banks in all of that is going to be the reallocation of capital. The economy that we have post the pandemic is not going to be the recreation of the economy of 12 months ago. There's going to be a reformed economy mm -hmm. that is changed through all of the things that have occurred to us in the last um, six to 12 months, and it's going to be fundamentally different. And if we work hard and, and, um, and focus on it, there's the chance to build the platform for Australia, a bit like we did back in the late 80s, early 90s, when, when we responded to similar economic um, challenges by building a platform for, for the next several decades. And to me, that's, that's where banks play right into their role. That, that is the role for, for banks for me in the next 12 to 24 months is to facilitate that reforming of the economy. Um, thanks. Just before I throw it open to the audience, um, we've talked a little bit about you know, innovation and currency and payments. And before I do that, I just don't want to miss the opportunity, uh, particularly to hear from maybe um, Nikesh and Colin. Uh, one of, the, I mean, one of the challenges is not just for banks. It's probably globally the big challenges there are for government, and I think it's fair to say that through COVID we've probably seen government put back into the middle of and the centre of everything, in a way that perhaps they had not been for a couple of decades, and that really puts gives government the opportunity to start thinking and the obligation to start thinking differently about how they do what they do, and we saw the. Um, Australian government issue a discussion paper, I think about a fortnight ago now, um, on the Australian payment system, recognising that this is going to be one of the pieces of critical infrastructure over the next decade. It's likely to be subject to accelerated and rapid change and asking the big questions, not, you know, not the kind of technicalities about, you know, how does how does the money come out of your account to my account, Nikesh, but much bigger picture questions about what is the appropriate governance of the Australian payment system? What's the appropriate ownership? How do we make sure it is fit for purpose um, over the next couple of decades? And you know, what's the role of government in the payment system? What's the role of the uh, private sector in the system? What is the role of regulators? What is the most appropriate regulators? Um, and the, these are questions, it seems to me the payment system and the evolution of our payment system to now where it is is one of the best in the world has been very organic. It has evolved here and things have been set up to make that bit work and evolved over here and made, you know, a thing set up to make that work. And I think the government's kind of trying to put their hands around its throat and say, what do we need it to look like and how, what is the role of government in facilitating that? So 
you may or may not have had a chance to think about it, but it's, it's some big, big sky thinking. And yeah, I think from yeah. the in industry's perspective, be interesting to see, um, you know, what your perspective is. D definitely, and look, that's that's a fascinating um, uh, topic, and you know, we can talk for hours on it. But look, look essentially, essentially, you know, look, I think I think the amazing thing that we've seen recently is the ability in this electronic age for governments to insert. Uh, you know, money where it needs to be, right? Which, which I'm, you know, we mentioned before, we couldn't have done, you know, 20, uh, 50 years ago. Now, now, I, I, I think, I think there are a few interesting things that we're seeing um, uh, happening, uh, you know, globally. So, so the, the the ability for monetary policy as a lever in terms of setting interest rates is, I think, diminishing. And um, you know, Bessie, you might be able to confirm that. No, I agree with that. But I think, yeah. Um, I, I think the other, the, the 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 power of the government to Issue money and target it where it needs to be. You know, is 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 growing um, as we saw with JobKeeper, as we saw with the um, you know cash incentives uh, that the government issued. I, I I think I think one of the big things I'd like to um, I, I look. A number of central banks are looking at this, but the potential for um, a central bank issued digital currency to to not only manage what we call um, money base, but broad money. Uh, could be really interesting and ha be much more powerful. And I don't know if many people know this. Um, I'm, I'm sure m many of the members do, but the cashless debit card is a fantastic example of how how the government can control where money needs to be and how it gets spent. Um, you know, so it's, it limits what you could spend that money on. And I, I, I think the, these um, innovations are, are, are fascinating, really. Um, and I'd be interested to hear from uh, Bessie Yu and uh, Colin as to you know what you think. Uh, uh, which direction we're going to be heading in in those areas, particularly around you know potentially digital currency and alternate ways of issuing money? I'll probably leave that one to Colin, I think. But I, I'd agree with you in yeah. that um, there is arguably a, a bigger role for governments to play in trying to stimulate economic activity further. Certainly, um, the RBA could still do more and it still has the available means to do more, but um, certainly I think the, the government has more, more ability to do more in this sort of environment. There's a real risk for us in that. Because um, if, you, if you think about the money we've printed to, to get to where we are today and therefore the very low interest rate environments we've got, really set for a long time. Um, if at some point inflation does emerge, given the level of government debt, the response to manage that is going to have to be fiscal, not monetary, I think. Um, and that's a bit of a challenge, given we, we put monetary policy in the hands of independent parties to avoid it becoming political. So I think that's going to be quite an interesting piece to to watch both on the stimulus side, but also on the control and management side, if or when inflation re-emerges. On the payments question, I think there's some lessons really from how we're seeing open banking play out, um, which is around getting the infrastructure and settings right to enable innovation to take place and, and the market to decide. I think it's been it's sort of, I think, playing out um, a little bit in the way we expected, which is that it was going to be quite slow in terms of uptake initially, but, but a very significant and important innovation for customers um, in terms of their data and how that's managed. And I think the um, what, what we'll see is that speed, that speed up as customers further understand it and players begin to play with it, and in particular as um, particular participants create solutions for customers that drive significant demand. And we'll, so we'll see the market decide where that should land based on that sort of demand and supply continuing to, to find the right balance in, in terms of data. And I think a similar analogy could be applied to digital currencies and how they evolve. There's obviously mm -hmm. been a lot of activity in dig digital currencies and an accelerating activity, how that then plays into the future of fiat currency and the role of government, I think is going to be a little bit about focusing on the infrastructure and getting the settings right and then allowing the market to evolve. And, and, and Colin, look, that's, that's interesting. I'd be um, in, interested to know your thoughts around um, 
uh, you, you know, you said you know, potentially leave it to the market, but the fact is, is that you know, I think a lot of people are probably thinking that if you look at open banking right, okay, um, uh, FPOS, BPAY, MPP, direct entry, we've got so many ways of doing the same thing. And from a consumer point of view, all they want to do is get money from A to B. I think there's a lot of rationalization potential there. But the other thing is, I, you know, and I think, I think Australia's in a unique position because as, as Anna mentioned, um, you know, we've led the world in uh, our ability to, to do electronic transactions. Um, the big question is that now that we're a global economy, right, should that be, should that exercise be done at a global level rather than, you know, us continuing to, you know, just develop our own systems? Valid question. Yeah. And I, I mean, there's a lot of consistency in how some of that's starting to emerge, and particularly when you get to digital currencies, obviously that's um, challenging this notion of nations that we've created and the monetary systems around nations. And I think, you know, that that's got a lot of time to play out, but there is going to need to be a degree of consistency in global settings, I think. And, and I, I, I'm not saying there shouldn't be any nudging. So um, incentives for customers and for players to help the market evolve. But ultimately, I, I would go down a route of, of allowing the market to form. Yeah. Um, thank you. Can I um, just invite our audience, if you do have questions for anyone on the panel, uh, please, I think you can just um, submit those questions uh, via the chat line uh, and we look forward to hearing and answering any questions that you may have. If you've got comments, um, then we'd also be interested in hearing and responding to those. Uh, Colin, can I just um, take you back uh, to some of the issues that I think have really um, played heavily on the banking industry's mind over the last couple of years and that's the issue of trust. Um, you know, trust and reputation within the broader public and community, and also trust uh, with, you know, from regulators and government. Uh, you know, crises um, have the ability to completely change relationships. And as I said before, I think one of the things that COVID's done globally has put government back at the centre of everything, and not just during the response, but likely back at the centre of everything during the recovery, which may well be over a number of years. Um, I think it's also, we've seen, I think through the Edelman work, that, that the public's trust in some of the institutions that they had started to, that had started to erode, so whether it's government or banks or the corporate sector has started to return, um, which for you know, everybody in the sector who's been working so hard on these issues, I think it's always important when you're trying to make big change that people see progress. And I think that's really helped a lot of people feel um, feel really good about working in banking again when they've seen the sort of purpose of banking being achieved with customers in a real way every day. How do you see that trust issue playing out over the next couple of years? Um, we've talked earlier about there are inevitably going to be some really tough calls for some customers, some of whom will make those calls you know, much more easily and quickly than others, and it will have different consequences. Uh, and it seems to me that's the next challenge is um, the, 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 to the extent that any trust has been recovered, it feels to me like it's still quite fragile. And regaining trust is always a marathon, not a sprint. And I'd just be interested in your thoughts about uh, you know, how banks, how conduct next year and outcomes for customers are going to play into that. Yeah, it's lots and lots of small incremental steps normally. Yeah. But, but obviously what we saw in March, April was a big step change. So I think of this topic, um, the industry's made a really good start. The, the, the ac action, the posture um, in March, the way that banks engaged, the fact that we didn't get into protecting the balance sheet first and foremost, but we took a, a longer term view and a societal view, I think that made a significant change to how the industry is viewed. Interestingly, I think, sorry, just as a quick aside, one of the things that allowed that to happen, I think, was the fact that we had a Royal Commission. And so, so I think if, to the point we were talking about earlier, if this had happened back in 2006, I think there's every chance that might not have happened. And by the way, we wouldn't have had the liquidity and the capital 
to deal with it and we could have ended up with a far different outcome if we hadn't had some of the problems of the past. But if we think about how that trust that has been re-established to a point gets locked in, if you like, it's lots of small decisions made in the right way. Um, but I don't really see there's a great deal of risk around intent there. I feel like generally banks are taking a long-term view. They'll, they'll take the hard decisions when they need to. It's going to be very important that this isn't a free-for-all and I don't think prudentially that will be the case. But I do think there'll be the right level of empathy and focus on the customer. I think the biggest risk for next year is execution. Yeah. Is, is translating intent into the lived experience for customers and for staff, particularly if we have this sort of split economy where we have some parts booming and, and others really struggling. From a capability point of view, what banks will normally do in a downturn is redirect bankers to look after the troubled books, look after the customers in, in difficulty. If you've got bankers that are going to need to focus on those areas of growth and those you know, vectors of opportunity for the economy and therefore for banks in the provision of credit and um, capital to facilitate that, it does mean there's the chance of banks being stretched in terms of their human and other capability to deliver on the intent in supporting customers that are struggling. I guess if we look at some of the industries that have been really hard hit, they're those industries that have been very sensitive to people movement, um, as well as international travel, which is included in that, and, and, and services. So services-based um, industries have been harder hit than goods-based industries. So some of the consumer trends we're seeing is a move towards goods, away from services, a move, a move towards the homebody economy, um, which takes into account gardening, renovating your home, um, the caring economy. Um, so I guess if we look at that, um, the one thing that we haven't talked about is the encouraging news around the, an effective vaccine, uh, which in the United States is um, meant to start being distributed before the end of the year. Uh, and in the, the UK, UK started today. this Friday. Right. Um, so I think that could really change people movement. And it also has obviously the great possibility to change international borders, which would then possibly also change uh, immigration numbers and population growth numbers. Um, so I think there's the possibility that we may see some upside next year. I still think there's lots of uncertainty. I still think it'll be a bumpy ride, but um, certainly I think we are still finishing 2020 on a note where there is some cautious optimism. I think you're absolutely right about the, your point about people, the, critis, the criticality of people movement. And if the vaccine does deliver that much faster than we had anticipated, uh, then some of the people that Colin's just been talking about uh, and some of those highly exposed sectors may actually be getting back on their feet rather than having hard, hard conversations with their banks. So, but I agree with you, Colin, um, execution is, um, is going to be the risk and it's not an easy thing for banks to make the right decisions about the, where the best resources are put at any given moment when the sand keeps shifting under their feet. But uh, as I said, lots of opportunities. Um, I did want to say to the audience, I understand we've had some technical difficulties accessing uh, some of your questions, so uh, bear with us and um, uh, we're, we're grateful for your patience. But we do have um, one question from the audience and that is um, from, I think probably to each of our panelists, uh, the question is, what do you see as the biggest opportunity in banking 2021? And I might just even slightly recast that and say, you know, if you could say one thing, um, and Besser, it's a bit hard because you've got to say it to your bank, <laughs> but you know, banking generally, if you yeah. could, you know, what do you think is the one thing that banks could do um, as an opportunity to, to help Australia get, you know, make the most of the opportunity to recover, but also set them set banks and their customers up for opportunities and well-being into yeah. the next decade. And if, if, if I can, and it sort of follows on from what both Bess and Colin was saying. Um, uh, from I think I think one of the regrets that uh, that I've got um, from the Royal Commission and what's what's happened is that all the banks have walked away from wealth management pretty much, and. Um, the reason that that's an issue and the reason it's a potential opportunity in 2021 is that um, uh, if, if you think about it, right, uh, a, a transaction account, a term deposit is not as good an investment as it was five or 10 years ago or, or back in the 80s. Um, 
what does someone, uh, if you take an average person, if they've got $1,000 to spare, how best do they uh, invest that? There's no good advice alternative now. Um, the, the banks are no longer in wealth management. What do they do with their money? I think, I think um, a big opportunity for banks is helping people on the investment side. That's, that's my view. Interesting, given where we've been on that issue, yeah. Nikesh. But it's been full circle, yeah. I know. But. Yes, but it, and mm. we've got more Australians retiring with, um, with more substantial lump sums as mm. a result of our superannuation system over the next decade than we've had in the last couple of decades. So, Bessa. I think it's continuing the dialogue between the bank and their customers and being part of that bridge where you're trying to help otherwise viable businesses survive and get through this period. They otherwise would survive and flourish without the pandemic. Then it's about being part of that bridge. So whenever I'm out speaking to our customers, I always encourage our customers to reach out to the relationship managers and the relationship managers to reach out to the customers because there is thought leadership within the bank and and also the bank has lots of resources and insights as to how industries might shift and how they might grow. So it's really important that that dialogue continues. Colin. I think it's sensory capability. I think we are all guessing as to what's going to happen next year because so much of what we've experienced is unprecedented and so much of next year is unknown. And therefore, the critical thing to succeed, I think, is going to be to spot the trends as they emerge, spot where the opportunities are starting to um, come through, whether those be through a new economy and, and how it um, re-establishes itself and where the risks emerge. I think one of the real challenges is spotting the difference between supporting a viable business through a tough patch and working out where there are just fundamental changes you know how many cafes do we need in the cbd um you know where to for retail there are some really big questions i think that we don't know the answers to but we're gonna have to be pretty alive to and so to me the the recipe for success next year is going to be to be very alert to be able to spot what's going on and respond quickly and I think that's part of the structural changes that are underway. This pandemic will leave us with some um, permanent um, structural changes. So, you know, the, the greater demand for to live in smaller cities, to live in the regional areas, um, and, and that also includes um, working from home. Um, you know, as as we've had um, a more successful suppression of the virus in recent weeks and months, there has been a return of people to work and in the CBD, but it's not to the same share that it was, and it's likely never going to be. And so the demand, for example, for office CBD property has shifted. Um, the demand for retailing within the CBDs has shifted. So some of those structural changes will remain permanent. Colin, on a slightly different note, uh, I think it's fair to say that you know every organisation, you know corporate, government, community, not for profits, everybody, was required this year, either through COVID or bushfires or both, um, to do some very big and fast pivots, to operate differently, to think differently, as you said, to to sort of pick trends, to take a few risks on what may or may not happen, um, and I'm interested in. Um, you, you have a role, obviously, to play with regulators. And one of the challenges for banks has been, in some ways, this is not an economic recession. It's a health crisis that's had economic impacts. So we haven't got businesses that are temporarily failing because their goods or services, you know, there's no demand for them anymore or, or they're just or very bad. Or interest rates are high. Or they've yeah. got high interest rates or they're just not good at the business. To the extent that they're struggling or failing, it's because governments have shut them down. So the challenge for banks has been how to look through COVID, how to take this customer, a mortgage customer, a you know, credit card customer, a, um, you know, a business, and look through and say, you're doing really well. I think your sector's going to get through it, but there's going to be this dip and we're going to get you to the other side. That, um, and that, that's not an easy one, and banks are still working on that on a day-to-day -day basis almost. But it has required um, regulators, I think, to think quite differently. Uh, some of the, you know, when I talk about look through, if you were in a different kind of economic circumstance, you know, you'd have a prudential regulator saying, no, you're not going to do that. <laughs> you know, 
um, but in fact, what you've got is a, a regulator that I think has really understood what the challenge is for the regulated bodies. So I'm interested in your observation, um, given the work you do um, as an advisor to regulators, um, you know, whether it's been the work that you had to do, I know, to pivot, to help them pivot quickly, um, you know, around uh, the appropriate application of the accounting standards um, in a co you know, mid-COVID environment or, or any other observations about um, you know, how regulators have responded or pivoted um, in this environment? Yeah, I think there's, um, if you put yourself in the regulator's shoes, there's a bit of a challenge that there's a lot of downside and not much upside as you, as you work through those <laughs> questions. And so I think quite reasonably, particularly when there's prudential questions in play, um, the approach to me seems to have been to try and help deal with what are clearly short-term effects that are going to reverse quickly and, and not unduly swing wildly one way or the other, but broadly ensure that the downside is managed. And so I, I think that means that some of the forbearance from the regulators we've seen this year, which has been a big part of contributing to the way that the banks have been able to respond and therefore the way the country's been able to get through this so far as as long as we are through it and we don't have multiple new versions next year. Um, uh, that's helped enormously, but I think most of that temporary change is probably emerged as temporary. And so, you know, in advising clients, you've always just got to think about what would you do if you were the regulator here with the objectives and pressures that you have um, on yourself. And so I think that's, that's where I see that heading is, is, yes, let's not make the swings wild, but we can't start forbearing forever because for, if for no other reason than from a national perspective, we can't have any perception that there's inappropriate regulatory settings. Now, thankfully, what we've seen this year is, you know, tremendous um, increase in the volume of capital in the system, the provisioning from an accounting point of view is pretty healthy. If you look at the numbers, there's been a build up of what what one would hope is the capital, liquidity and balance sheet strength to allow banks with some consideration from, from the regulators to um, have some wriggle room as they work through things with customers and, and, and make sure that equally there's not too many wild swings in, in the way that, that banks respond. I think the other thing from the regulators is the agenda that was paused um, for for a few months, you know, maybe six months in the, the year to allow people to deal with the crisis is still the sort of hangover from the Royal Commission and that's still, that's still got a way to play out. Ultimately, there's a lot of um, resolution of all of that to play out in delivering on plans and and compliance and customer outcomes and how vulnerability is considered and products are designed and distributed and all those sorts of things, which um, has definitely restarted. The regulators have sent some clear signals that that agenda has not gone away. And so there's a bit of um, rubbing your tummy and patting your head at the same time. Um, uh, yeah, I, just on that, it's interesting. I think it's you know, somebody has said, you know, when, on the one hand, I think human beings are very good at going through something difficult, challenging, a crisis, and learning something from it, and therefore being better prepared next time around and adapting, and that's part of resilience. Um, but it's equally true that sometimes we spend a lot of time preparing. Um, we think we're preparing for the next crisis, but actually when the next crisis comes, it's so different, you realise actually you've been preparing for the last crisis. And uh, much of the regulatory pause, um, certainly from government, it's predominantly been Royal Commission, but from APRA, it's still been some of the um, global um, post-GFC uh, prudential um, architecture. And I think we're anticipating, hopefully, either today or sometime this week, uh, that we'll see APRA come out with the next round of their capital framework um, consultation. And I know that not just here in Australia, but globally, there's been a discussion among, among regulators. Um, on the one hand, we, as you said, we went in, banks went into this with, you know, st so strongly capitalised, they could be the shock absorber. And they were so strongly capitalised because they've been required to build up buffers. But when, they, when they've tried to access those buffers, 
it hasn't been as straightforward as I think regulators and banks had anticipated. Um, over 10 years, they'd, um, everybody had, the rhetoric they had used had led investors and analysts and um, ratings agencies to form a certain view about what a buffer is or, or what its purpose is. And so there's some work to be done there. And, you know, I just, I know I'm putting you on the spot here, Colin, but whether you have any observations on what, if anything, you think might be globally, whether prudential regulators um, and accounting setting bodies, accounting standards setting bodies, uh, are likely to look at and say, well, this is how we thought over the last 10 years, and most of it actually worked, which it did, but here are some things we should probably reconsider or tweak. Um, I'm not sure they're going to be unhappy with the way the last crisis prepared us for this one, because while there might be some inefficiency in that, um, it hasn't um, caused problems. Liquidity is a fascinating point, right? This hasn't been touted as a liquidity crisis. The last one definitely was. Um, uh, but I think we we should always remember it could have been. Like, if you look at how markets reacted in February and March, there was a great deal of um, volatility, a, a lot shifted in equity markets, bond markets. And that could have, that could have cascaded through, but there was greater sort of liquidity buffer in the system and, and that helped us through. I mean, you just need to, just a bit of a crass um, comparison, but you just need to look at how hard it was to get toilet paper in March to think about what happens when fear runs wild. And, and I think therefore the um, the steps that were taken to repair the last crisis, and I totally agree with you, you, you it was to repair the last one, not necessarily prepare for this one, but it, it did mean that this one I think has been better managed than it otherwise would have been. Hmm. The only yes, thing I I'd add, Anna, good. is that um, central banks around the world um, have delivered waves of stimulus, as has governments, yeah. and the world is awash with liquidity. And there will be another crisis because we know through history that there's always another black swan event. Um, I, I guess, um, you know, my only concern is if that crisis comes too quickly, then we're, we're sort of already on, you know, central banks are already with, I guess, depleted Sorry. firepower. And you could even argue governments are uh, with depleted firepower. So, so that's probably the one mm. big question mark. And obviously, you can't predict black swan yeah. events. But um, you, you could argue this one is that. And um, you know, within the next 10 or 20 years, you might see another one. Mm. OK, well, look, I'm going to um, wind it up now. I think we've touched on a lot of uh, points that have not only resonated for with me and I'm sure our audience about the experience of 2020, but given us all a lot to think about uh, for 2021, uh, a year that is undoubtedly not going to be without its challenges. But I think from all different perspectives, you've all articulated some very big opportunities, some of which I think um, are going to be very exciting. And if we get them right, uh, it positions um, us here in Australia uh, very well on the global stage over the coming five to 10 years. So um, here's to 2021. I think I'm in good company in saying that 2020 is a year we will all enjoy saying goodbye to. Uh, and with that, can I thank each of our panelists uh, to um, Nikesh, to Bessa and okay. to Colin. Thank you for taking time out. Uh, these are the sorts of questions uh, I know that many people in the industry and, and in our audience uh, will be contemplating. Um, as they're watching the cricket over summer. So thank you. Uh, and can I just say Merry Christmas to you, your families and your teams. I hope you all enjoy a well-earned, very safe and happy break. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Thanks. Thank you.